And again, welcome everybody to our 131st episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. My name is Benji Cohn, and today we're talking about a great fall activity that's a lot of fun, especially if you have dogs. But Bailey Peterson, our assistant area wildlife manager up in the Two Harbors region, is going to talk about getting out there uh, with your dogs, traveling around, and trying to find some birds. So we have a we have a lot of areas in this state to cover, and there's a lot of states out there that you can cover if you have dogs and want to do some hunting. So I think with that, Bailey, I'll let you take it away. And... Sounds good, Benji. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Bailey Peterson. I'm the Assistant Area Wildlife Manager up in Two Harbors. <clears throat> so I've been up here since 2014. Um, besides managing um, our habitat and some of our um, Hunter Walking Trail and Wildlife Management Area facilities up here. I get a lot of calls this time of year about people wanting to come up and grouse hunt in this area. Uh, woodcock hunt, um, spruce grouse is a big um, kind of bucket list bird for people I get calls about. So I'm always super happy to help um, fellow bird hunters with information about how to find the birds and, you know, plan their trips up here. Um, since I'm kind of located in the far northeastern part of the state if i want to hunt any other of our many birds or game bird species here in minnesota i do have to plan trips to travel elsewhere as well so planning a diy bird hunting trip is something that i do quite often um this going back a little bit more into my history i was a uh, got my bachelor's degree from bemidji state university and while i was there i um worked for the outdoor program center as a um, trip guide so i spent a lot of time planning um, weekend long or week long um, rock climbing canoeing kayaking backpacking skiing snowboarding trips and so <laughs> logistics and trip planning has been something that i've been kind of doing a lot of for for quite some time now <laughs> and so really happy to be here to discuss this topic with you um, i have it's a huge topic to cover in a short amount of time i think just the um, category of e-scouting alone, I think I could probably talk about easily for at, at least an hour. Um, so I'm gonna breeze through a lot of stuff. Um, my contact information will be uh, at the end on the last slide. I'm happy to talk to anybody um, if you wanna reach out um, for any follow-up um, after this presentation. All right. So just a brief outline of what we'll discuss here today, um, Minnesota game bird species um, to hunt, uh, maybe hunting game birds in other states, how to figure out where to hunt, licenses, uh, your lodging options, just briefly touch on camp cooking, uh, gun shells and chokes, and then quite a bit about dog considerations. All right, different species to hunt in Minnesota. We have our um, prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse opportunities, mainly in the west and northwestern parts of the state. Um, like I mentioned before, spruce grouse, <clears throat> which are kind of in our northern boreal forest type covers, the edge of the Canadian Shield, where we get the more monotypic spruce and um, sometimes jack pine type covers. Uh, rough grouse and American woodcock pretty much scattered throughout the forested zone. Uh, pheasants located mainly throughout our prairie ecosystems that overlap quite a bit into the transition zone as well. And uh, other what I consider bucket list game birds, um, the common snipe and the rail species and the um, isolated populations of Hungarian partridge in Minnesota as well. And in other states, I mean, there's so many different bird species you can hunt. Um, the prairie grouse get kind of lumped together, sharpies, uh, prairie chickens, and I threw Hungarian partridge in there as well, even though they're not a true grouse um, species. But the perk of hunting uh, some of the prairie grouse species in other states is that a lot of the seasons open before our seasons open here in Minnesota. So um, if you're antsy like me, you might head out west. Um, before our rough grouse season opens. Uh, sage grouse, mountain grouse, which is the two subspecies of blue grouse, the dusky and city. 
uh, of course, rough grouse, um, and then this other spruce grouse, which is the Franklin subspecies. We have the easternmost um, huntable populations of spruce grouse here in Minnesota, and then out west they have a slightly different subspecies. Um, there's such a variety of quail species you can hunt, um, bobwhite quail and pheasant being probably the, er, well, not that pheasants are a quail species, but I lumped them together because in, in the lower Midwest you can find them, um, you know, quite often in the same covers or um, at least on the same hunting trip. And that, I just made a note, you know, is usually open at least through um, January or even February in some states. And it's it's a pretty doable drive um, from Minnesota. So something, if you are still antsy after our season ends, <laughs> you could head not too far away and hunt bobwhites, or you could hunt, or head quite a bit further away and hunt the desert quail, which is Merns Gamble and Scale Quail, um, which probably have some of the latest seasons in the lower 48. Uh, Valley Mountain Quail, Chucker Partridge, um, there's some ptarmigan species, uh, you can hunt the white-tailed ptarmigan in a few places in um, the lower 48 and then up in Alaska. Um, you could hunt all three species and there's a few others that I missed as well. Um, so yeah, when you're planning a trip, you want to start with a goal in mind, usually what species are you looking to target? Um, or are you looking to target multiple species? Or um, My husband's kind of a avid fly angler, so I often have to add sort of a cast and blast component to my hunting trips um, if there's opportunity for some sort of trout fishing or something along the way um, that can really break up a trip or um, give the dogs a rest for a day or two or whatever. It's, this is fun to add different things in sometimes. You could even, you know, throw a big game species in there as well if you planned enough ahead of time to get drawn in a lottery or something. Um, and yes, yeah, so just verify all seasons will be open in conjunction with your trip or your plans and be flexible to allow for successes or to spend a few days longer in one area if you need to. Just kind of depends on your um, goals for the trip. Uh, research as much as you can ahead of time. I can't stress that enough. Have places that you are planning to visit and also scout, um, scout or e-scout backup locations. You know, there's a decent amount of pressure on public lands sometimes and um, you might not get to the first spot you want to go to or, you know, it might not hold as many birds as you hope that it would. Um, you can do a lot of research through old literature or books, online articles are great to read, um, usually quite informational and give you a head start on maybe a location or area or at least the type of terrain that you're looking for. And then of course the state fish and game websites. And then once you get out there, you can always ask the locals when the opportunity presents itself. So how to figure out where to hunt. Um, this is the pre-planning and e-scouting portion. Um, the, both of these things are just invaluable to um, a, you know, a safe and successful DIY trip. If we're looking just inside of Minnesota um, for a bird hunting road trip, the DNR Recreation Compass is a great tool to start with. And then the landing pages for the wildlife management areas, the rough grouse management areas, our hunter walking trails, our walk-in access sites, and, and many other pages on our DNR website are going to give you a lot of information to start with um, and, and just give you lots of information to uh, research. And then you can start nailing down and dropping pins on sites that you want to visit once you hit the field. Uh, a lot of states have very similar websites. Um, most state uh, DNR or Game and Fish Department websites that I've seen have some sort of mapping application um, designed to assist the traveling hunter with information about where to hunt. I just did a little screenshot of um, Wisconsin's, um, uh, their mapping application for um, game birds specifically. They'll um, highlight Aspen that is with what they would consider to be prime age. And then um, they'll also highlight some of the lowland brush stuff that they think would be more suitable for woodcock. Um, so that's kind of a neat app that they have over there, um, just with the bird hunter in mind. Whereas over here we have our rough grouse management areas that are specifically managed for rough grouse. And so if rough grouse was your target species, 
um, a great place to start would be to look at the rough grouse management areas, see what the species, um, I, I mean tree species, um, kind of the diversity and structure looks like. And you can take that and sort of interpolate it onto others nearby sites that may not be designated RGMAs. But if you're seeing those same components, you could be pretty sure that there's going to be equally, um, you know, desirable habitat. Um, so you can also look at our species specific surveys. Um, every state that I've seen has posts their um, species specific surveys or hunt prediction maps or their species distribution maps. Um, and I just want to, with the caveat of it shouldn't be limiting on whether or not to select a certain area, but do your research and take all of it in and see <laughs> these surveys that we as biologists do um, to, to survey a population is what's called an index survey quite often, and it's not meant necessarily to um, predict your hunting success in a specific area, but more for long-term um, population modeling. Um, so while it can be a great way to figure out where to go, um, for example, fe our pheasant prospects map, clearly southwestern Minnesota is where you're going to want to spend your time, but whether or not something is in the brown or good category or in the red or fair category can really change, um, you know, on a day to day basis, you know, possibly even depending on something like moisture or just um, conditions that particular day, you may end up finding a ton more birds and what was called fair. It, it's not um, necessarily something that you should go by. Um, to determine whether or not to go somewhere. So just definitely try to hit a lot of different spots um, when you're, especially when you're first learning um, to try to nail down the sites that you want to go to. Uh, a lot of counties in Minnesota or across the country, you're going to have parcel maps um, showing you the land ownership. Um, and there's a whole suite of different apps um, that you can get on a smartphone to utilized for identifying public or private land um, boundaries. And then um, understand the different state administered programs for private land that is open to public hunting in Minnesota. We call this the walk-in access program. Um, there's just a variety of these programs in, in other states that are awesome um, programs for, for traveling wing shooters, but just for, for hunters in general to, to use. Just a little more on e-scouting. Um, learn to uh, interpret aerial photographs. That's really going to be the best advice that I can give you. For um, birds associated with agriculture, you're going to want to learn to identify your crop layers um, and, and your grass layers to so understand what's food and what's cover and then how, you know, how those may correlate and how you may want to plan a hunt um, depending on the different features on a piece of public land. Uh, and then for birds associated with the forest, you're going to want to more be, try to learn to identify um, your younger trees from older trees, uh, hardwoods from um, aspen or birch, uh, and your conifers from uh, your um, deciduous trees. And the longer you stare at aerial photos and ground truth, um, uh, uh, you know, on the ground, you're going to get better and better at your skills um, for e-scouting. Uh, and for all birds, really, if you can find water, um, you can usually find uh, suitable cover nearby. You want to be able to identify low areas and high areas. Most of these mapping applications are going to have um, a terrain layer that should help you identify high terrain versus low areas. Um, and again, with low areas comes uh, usually moisture, and uh, that is usually a good spot to key in to find birds. And plan to scout ahead of time um, or give yourself a day or two when you get there to do either a mix of hunting um, and scouting or just scouting. Um, it takes it does take time to learn new species um, and new covers and definitely try to adjust your expectations and, and you know, plan your threshold for success. Is, is success getting a bird on a trip uh, or limiting out every day? It, it really going to depend on your um, your goals for yourself and your trip. Um, and, you know, maybe just varies depending on your, your target quarry as well.
Um, and so there's a few options when you're choosing to do a DIY trip. Are you going to base your hunting location around the availability of lodging or open campgrounds? Um, you know, depending on the time of the year, that can vary quite a bit as well. Um, your distance to amenities, uh, other, you know, factors like that. We get a lot of calls, um, you know, when families want to come out and so they need, you know, a different, a different, uh, Kind of lodging option then you know maybe the single person with a truck of dogs that wants to come out and um you know camp or sleep in their truck for a weekend so it just uh you got to pick you know your kind of lodging option or what what works best for you and uh, either pick your location based on that or choose your hunting location based on the availability of quality habitat and public lands or designated trails and facilities, and then, then you work to find lodging options nearby. You definitely have to take vehicle capabilities into account when you're finding hunting spots, uh, depending on where you are in the state or the country, uh, and the time of year, of course. So hunting seasons in the fall, we can either get a ton of moisture, it's been raining here for the last four days straight, for example, or the later you get into the season, um, you're gonna end up with um, snow and ice or possibly um, freezing and melting conditions. And so sometimes these roads can get extremely muddy or, or you may need a high clearance four by four vehicle while other areas are, you know, totally reachable by passenger car. So it just depends on um, where you're going and what your limitations might be in that realm. Uh, another tip is just to reach out and call your local DNR office or Fish and Wildlife Service office, depending on where you're going. Talk to a, you know, possibly try to find a local bird hunter or biologist and, and discuss, uh, you know, your options uh, for a good location to start. And that doesn't mean a pin dropped on a map, but at least like maybe a town or a zone or a region. Um, if you're looking for mountain grouse, you might, you know, just discuss um, elevation, a contour, you know, number. So what, what, how many feet are you talking um, for grouse in that region? And then uh, maybe so much as getting like a mountain range or something like that. But prepare to uh, move around a lot as, as needed. Um, and I did put a little note there just to please be respectful um, and park appropriately for the weather, not to block gates or farm access roads. And to, if you are allowed through gates, um, on some of these um, private lands open to public hunting that is usually designated um, on the maps um, or a handout that you get uh, or uh, a note on the website uh, and close gates behind you. I was just out west in Montana a week ago and uh, there were notes up all over town about not blocking gates and uh, it's also um, required to have a fire extinguisher out there during the dry times of the year um, and it was dry at the time so you have to have a fire extinguisher or you can get a pretty hefty fine so there's just some different factors that are you know sometimes location or weather dependent but uh, it all comes down to you know try to be respectful of people's private property and then as well if you're um, at a state DNR facility like not to block the gates or uh, especially if there's, you know, perhaps like active timber management going on, um, not to block the path of um, equipment coming in and out. So licensing. Uh, in Minnesota, it's pretty simple. If you want to hunt um, upland birds, you need to have a small game license. And then if you want to hunt any migratory species, you want to make sure you get your HIP certification. Um, and that's for you know, waterfall as well as um, woodcock and snipe and other migratory species. If you're going to hunt pheasants, you do need a pheasant stamp in Minnesota. Um, and then for waterfall, um, you're going to need your uh, state and federal duck stamps. For the walk-in access sites that I was discussing earlier, you do need to uh, purchase a walk-in access validation. And then if you put in for the prairie chicken lottery, there is a separate license for, for that species as well. Um, in some other states, uh, it's you need what's called a base or conservation license, and then you need to purchase, you know, like a one, three, or seven day or season long upland game bird license. So, some of the different states have different licenses. It just definitely need to um, dig into that and make sure you get the right 
license type for what you're looking to target. Um, not all states sell licenses at uh, sporting goods stores or convenience stores like we do in Minnesota. Um, so it's definitely good to plan ahead or to purchase online and print it out. Um, my first year I went to Montana, I did not realize this. I just assumed there'd be a holiday station in every small town like there is in Minnesota where I could buy a hunting license and we'd drive like an hour south to the nearest um, store that was open or else we would have had to wait till Monday to buy it at the local furniture store in town, which is the only place that sold hunting licenses. So I was, um, that was a kind of a surprise to me coming from Minnesota. Um, and then it's becoming more and more accepted to have either a screenshot or an electric electronic license. Some states have, um, you know, an app like an app on a smartphone for for your licensing, and so that is definitely becoming more acceptable. But you just want to make sure before you assume that it is that it is indeed um, accepted. All right, so lodging. So <laughs> lots of lodging options on a traveling wing shooting trip um you know there's your classic hotel motel option or like a cabin rental there's obvious perks there but it is going to probably be your most costly option and then if you're traveling with canine companions is it dog friendly um or perhaps that doesn't matter to you and that's totally fine um there's camping you know in like a travel trailer um, or disperse camping on public lands. Definitely make sure you read the regulations depending on where you're looking to go on whether it's allowed to just park, um, you know, anywhere on public lands. And Minnesota that is not the case in a, in a lot of spots. Um, tent camping, definitely, like I mentioned earlier, if there's inclement weather, um, it can also be quite warm still. So it's just kind of depends and then boondocking which is becoming a lot more popular um i just call it truck camping i it's pretty common for me to have a twin bed in the back of the truck with a whole bunch of tote bins and a whole bunch of dogs piled on top in the fall um when i head away on a weekend um trip somewhere but i got to say so camping in the ice castle with just you can fit a lot of dog kennels in there and it's pretty comfy pretty posh tra travel conditions for me. I love uh, grouse camp out of the ice castle for sure. Um, all right, packing, gun shells, chokes. A word of advice, always bring a backup gun on a hunting road trip. That is um, advice that I uh, learned from experience. And more so, a second word of advice, bring more shells than you think that you need. If, especially if you shoot a sub gauge, uh, good luck finding shells everywhere uh, if you run out. So 28 gauge shells are not available at every little town. And so if you're gonna shoot a sub gauge, uh, definitely bring more shells than you think that you might need. You can always bring them back home. Um, if your shooting is poor or you're crippling birds, uh, try changing out your chokes if you're able to or switching up your shot size. Not all game birds are knocked down equally. Um, it just seems like a grouse, grouse tend to be pretty easy to drop and pheasants tend not to want to go down as easily. And you definitely don't want to um, use the same size shell for both of those species. Um, you just wanna you know, pack both and plan ahead depending on what you're hunting. Um, and it can also occasionally help to switch up guns uh, if you shoot your way into a slump and you need to shoot your way back out of a shooting slump. <laughs> if it, as long as both these guns are something that you're comfortable and familiar with and, you know, feel safe doing so. Uh, follow all laws for traveling with firearms, especially if you're crossing state lines or traveling through metro areas. Um, there's different rules on casing um, or locking are uh, breaking down guns and then definitely pack a small gun cleaning kit uh, with some sort of oil or wipes, boar snake, um, so on. So some road trip essentials learned from experience. Uh, always bring a spare vehicle key, a tow strap, um, and jumper cables or jump pack. And some of these things are not just for if you get in a bind, but to help out a fellow hunter or traveler that you come across. The boot dryer, that is a definite necessity. 
um, one that works uh, in your truck out, like the um, power outlets in your truck is definitely a bonus um, if you're camping especially. Game shears, bird cleaning knife, storage bags, all your bird cleaning equipment. A quality cooler or portable refrigerator or freezer. That is definitely on my wish list to have a portable fridge um, or freezer on a trip. Um, water jugs. I bring about I bring a five gallon and a six gallon jug usually on most of my trips. Uh, trash bags. Um, you know, obviously just for your camp or your birds when you clean them. Um, but also just for picking up after others on public lands. I like to always try to leave things better than we found them. A headlamp, wash stations for your hands, dishes for the dogs, etc. A small folding table is nice. Um, camp chairs, rain gear, uh, and then your camp cooking essentials. Just a quick slide on camp cooking. Um, plan ahead to enjoy your harvest. I mean, you're going to be out there working hard. Um, sometimes the last thing you want to do after a long day is um, cook a big meal, but you're out here on this trip um, and sometimes it's just really nice to enjoy the fruits of your labor um, kind of in their home turf. Uh, so I just love um, cooking a meal out in the field. Um, and something that can help is to bring, you know, your marinades or brines or seasonings, planning ahead on that to enjoy your harvest while you're out there. Um, plan ahead uh, with your camp stove. Um, or your pots and pans, a portable grill, you know, uh, all these different types of camp stoves or grills are going to have different types of fuels. And um, if you can kind of mix and match, so you aren't bringing a bunch of everything, it can save on space a little bit. Um, so if you're bringing a cooler and you're planning to bring a bunch of like stuff along, um, like burgers, sprouts, or whatever, anything that can be frozen. Um, ahead of time will um, not only help those things keep longer, but um, it'll also help your, your cooler stay cold longer. And then in my cooler, I use um, as many frozen gallon jugs of water as I can keep in there. They, I find they're very clean and neat compared to using ice, um, and they keep for a very long time. Um, I always bring dehydrated meals as backups. I never plan to eat birds on a trip because it just seems like a good way to get skunked. Um, remember you're burning extra calories, walking a ton usually, so pack your food accordingly and pack lots of water for you, um, for the dogs, for cooking and for cleanup. And uh, also, of course, bring bird cleaning supplies along, uh, game shears or um, a bird cleaning knife, nitrile gloves and um, bags for birds for storing and garbage bags. Do not dispose of carcasses in your camp area or out on public lands. So traveling with dogs, um, I can probably talk about this for hours too. Um, make sure before you head out that you should um, get a copy of your vet records, especially your rabies certification, um, and know where your closest emergency vet is to your hunting location. Um, I really can't stress this enough. Stuff happens when you're away from home um, and depending on where you're hunting, there could be different local issues, uh, snake bites coming to mind, um, barbed wire issues, and, and some of these things are going to require immediate vet attention. So it's always good to have the number of the closest emergency vet to your hunting location and in then just a plan of how to get there um, if needed. And with the hope of being prepared, you'll, you'll never have to need it. Um, then a first aid or in supply kit in the vehicle, and I carry some in my vest as well. Um, buy online or have the vet, uh, your vet, local vet, help you stock up. And I can't stress enough to condition your dogs prior to season in one way or another. Get them out running or swimming or, um, you know, hunting ahead of time. Ahead of your trip, I should say. Um, don't put your dogs on the ground once you get to your first trip of the year and expect them to be able to perform at top tier. Uh, definitely be prepared for any undesirable critter encounters. The top things that come to mind would be porcupines and skunks. 
one being difficult to deal with and one being really stinky to deal with. I always bring the skunk kit along with me, um, you know, hydrogen peroxide, Dawn dish soap, and um, baking soda, and know your ratios. <laughs> and that's why I said to bring a tub for both washing dishes and for washing dogs. Uh, and then porcupines, I have not been on a hunting trip out west where I haven't had to help other hunters remove quills um, from their dogs. It happens so often um, and you'd be surprised at the number of people who aren't prepared carrying um, hemostats. I prefer the smooth-faced hemostats for porcupine quills and um, or a multi-tool with you. It's just going to save a lot of time and um, you know get your dog back in uh, hunting condition faster hopefully. Uh, another good reason to have your emergency vet though in case you need it you know some know though sometimes those porcupine quills end up working their way into dangerous areas and, and sometimes a vet visit is definitely needed. Um, packing tie outs or stake outs and practicing tying your dogs out before the hunting season is definitely beneficial having uh sometimes you just don't want your dogs running around at large uh, whether it's roads or other dogs or people or whatever the situation might be um having stakeouts is quite nice um gps collars or e-collars whatever you use definitely make sure that when you head out for your trip isn't the first time that you're turning it on or um you know packing it up for the year definitely want to update anything that needs updates um, charge them, test them, and to pack a backup. Um, also pack more dog food than you think that you need. These dogs are going to be burning a lot of energy. Um, I've run out of dog food on multiple trips and I've had friends run out where I've needed to um, share with them on, on their trips as well. Uh, it is not uncommon for dogs to um, experience a gastrointestinal upset during a hunting trip, so plan accordingly. I always pack probiotics for my dogs. Uh, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to start using them prior to the trip and then throughout the trip just to keep them um, kind of a little more settled. And then keep weather extremes in mind um, in regards to heat or cold related illness. Uh, on the heat side, I pack um, electric fans in my truck um, to uh, have in the kennels, uh, hanging water bowls. I like those because they don't spill them as much. And then I have a Bluetooth thermometer um, so I can see what the temperature is um, in the back of the truck. Uh, and then in the cold, you know, whether you want to bring blankets in a kennel or um, use straw, uh, kennel covers, and, and with the note to make sure that everything is properly ventilated. The thermometer can come in handy um, in there too and it's just like it's a tiny little thing that you can um, stick in their kennel or on top of their kennel and just see what the temperature is in there. Um, so I just did a little picture here of a dump of my um, traveling first aid or supply kit with my dog. Uh, again, check your kit annually, replace any outdated or used items, know how and when to use everything that's in your kit. Um, so like I said, speak with your vet or better yet, you could bring your kit with you to your vet and have them look through it and add to it before traveling away on a hunting trip. Some of the things um, that you might need to bring along, you could only get from your vet, such as prescriptions or antibiotics or ointments. Um, I do carry subcutaneous fluids um, that my vet taught me how to use um, and uh, I rinse. Uh, and pain meds in case you have any issues that you need those for. Um, but there's some things that you can buy yourself, uh, wound rinse, gauze, more gauze, uh, vet wrap. That's like, those are like the most useful things I can carry with me, I think. And this is not just for dogs. These things are going to come in handy um, for helping out a buddy or if you have an incident as well. Um, athletic tape, thermometer, uh, stapler, and EMT gel. The stapler is a little controversial. A lot, a lot of times the vet won't want you to do it, but if you're in the back country, sometimes you don't really have a choice. So that's one of those things that um, is kind of up to you whether or not to, to carry. And But definitely if you do carry it to learn how to use it. Um, I always carry booties and I up here kind of um, 
and it's I use booties all winter long when my dogs are running on ice, but I use booties on um, my hunting trips to um, protect their feet when they um, get raw pad edges or if there was a toenail issue um, or if they're stepping on cactus or something just so I can clean it out and, and um, cover it. And then the booties will, will either protect my um, gauze and bet wrap um, wrapping or just to protect their foot from any further injury. Sometimes it can prolong your hunt because they can continue hunting as long as they're um, whatever it is is protected as long as they're not too injured. Uh, I did throw a muzzle on there because oftentimes when dogs are injured, um, you know, they, they may act a little bit differently than they normally do at home. Um, pack a vest if you were to end up with like a little cut or abrasion on, um, that you wanted to cover up. Um, hemostats, uh, su supplements, towels, uh, bag balm, musher secret, those are the things I use on their pads to keep them um, if they're getting a little bit raw. And then um, these are by no means essentials. I started hunting um, with a dog from the pound and an orange hat that I got for free from um, you know a sports show. So I, I started with almost nothing. And as I've gone on, I've, I've started carrying more and more supplies with me. Um, so again, this is what I carry with me. It is by no means necessary. I just like feel like I can spend a lot more time out there if I'm fully prepared. Um, for anything that I might encounter. So during certain times of the year, um, up here in the Northwoods, I will carry a trap setter with me. It's aluminum, it's super light. I forget that I have it in my vest once it's in there. Um, I also do carry the um, zip tie trapping kit um, from the Minnesota Trappers Association. Um, that's for, both of those would be for opening conibear traps should I ever need to. Um, I started carrying bear spray with me after an encounter um, that I had with the dogs with a bear. Um, cable cutter for if I were to come across any snares uh, or snare issues with my dogs, I should say. Multi-tool, that's good for so many different things. I forgot a can opener on my last trip and I use my multi-tool multiple times every day. Uh, a leash this, uh, that comes in handy all the time should your e-collar stop working or you're walking along um, back through a road or if you just need to leash up and head out. Um, it's just there's so many different reasons that, that would be handy. Uh, I do carry a collapsible bowl. Sometimes the dogs get tired of drinking out of water bottles. Um, I have squirt bottles that I carry um, in my vest um, as well for them, but sometimes the bowl is just better. Uh, I do have a little mini first aid kit. It's waterproof. It's got Benadryl bandages. I carry matches in there as well as some tape. Um, quick clot. I carry the clotting sponges. Um, vet wrap gauze and an extra booty. I carry eye rinse with me in the field up here in the grouse woods. Both humans and dogs are constantly getting their eyes poked by um, stuff in the woods and so or getting seeds in their eyes. Um, and so I do carry eye rinse on me and then have it at the truck as well. Compass. I, I do carry a GPS in the woods um, and then also, um, you know, a variety of mapping apps on my phone, but I do always have a compass along just in case technology fails and like I said a hemostat a hemostats and then most importantly for me is to always have snacks along and uh, I do uh, always have something for the dogs as well uh, and I think in that picture is also a bell I'll carry a bell um, I don't always run it on my dogs but sometimes I'll carry it along just in case I need it um, or I'll throw it on the dog and with that I think I breezed through everything pretty quick but I um I'm happy to take any questions. It was a lot of great information, Bailey. So thank you for Thanks. for sharing your obviously a passion for you and lots of knowledge there. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q and A section there, and we will get to that. So it sounds from your I learned this the hard way too. One of the first times I took my old lab out to South Dakota in a pheasant hunt, we had, it wasn't my dog, thankfully, but it was another dog got stuck with some barbed wire in the tummy area and we had to rush to an emergency vet and it was a big struggle trying to find where to go and oh, yeah. we weren't prepared and, and what to do and everything, everything turned out fine. It was great. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that I would have had a program 
if I would have had a program like this before, I would have known to bring, oh, maybe I should bring some of this first aid stuff for my dog too. But I just had a little personal first aid kit that was gauze and some tape that we used to get the dog to the vet and get him stitched up and that kind of shortened our hunting, but oh yeah, he wasn't, yeah, those barbed wasn't very happy. Be pretty serious. Yeah, wasn't a happy dog sitting in the truck for two days mm -hmm. for the rest of it. But so, if you want to pull your presentation down, you can do that. Okay. If anybody does have any questions, they can email you or get in touch with me. So that sounds great. Let me see, close the chat. We did put a lot of links to some of the things Bailey mentioned in the chat too. So if anybody wants to click on those and save those in your browsers, you can do that. Um, Thomas was asking, could you provide your slides as checklist? Also, I agree with the multi-tool for porcupines. My brother had both his wire hairs attack the same porky. So mm. that's, that's one thing I haven't had to do is take porcupine quills out, but is it pretty easy to do? Do you just kind of pull them straight out or? Oh, it really depends on the time, of, like the, what size the porky is, and then what the what the attack was like. I guess I've I've got um, three setters and a one German dog, and uh, <laughs> could get some flack for it, but I'll classify those as more the um, ones that are going to have issues with the um, porcupines. Uh, whereas the a lot of times your flushing dogs or your English dogs are gonna be more curious and they might just get like a few in their nose and chin. But if a dog is actually looking to grab and I've seen them swing swing the porcupines all around and they end up with them everywhere. And then when they're in the mouth is when there's really quite bad issues and that's usually a trip to the vet because if they're in the back of the throat, um, it just takes a a long time and it. it once you start getting good at pulling them out, you're less likely to break them. But if they do break off, or sometimes the dog is further away and they'll start um, pawing them off, and you can't um, always tell which ones have been broken. And it can get dangerous to have a porcupine quill um, migrate. Um, you know, it will migrate through the um, chest cat. That can be catastrophic for for dogs. Um, but Quite often, they're just in the face, and it's just more of a nuisance. And then you maybe want to get them on some antibiotics or something. But uh, it's painful for the dogs. The quills don't want to come out. They have um, barbs um, on them that want them to migrate inwards, and so pulling them outwards, you're just working against resistance. So it is not a fun. I bet Carol has Carol's opening a can of worms here, but oh. I'm going to ask you anyway, just for your personal opinion. What is your favorite firearm for bird hunting? Oh, um, I, I, that is a great question. I started, um, I started w by waterfowl hunting. That was my gateway into bird hunting. Um, and so I shot what I feel like everybody shot, which was a 12 gauge and, um, probably had like, I don't know, 30 inch barrels or something on it. And I've gotten, um, like smaller and smaller ever since then and I should, currently am shooting a 28 gauge with 27 inch barrels and I don't think I can maybe get a little longer barrels but I don't think I'm ever going to go back from that unless I'm shooting larger game um I don't shoot a lot of probably I don't hunt a lot of pheasants and and or waterfowl with a 28 gauge but uh, and I know you can you you definitely can um you just want to be mindful of your shot size um and maybe your choke but for grouse and woodcock, I, 28 gauges for me. It, they're very small, very light, and uh, I don't know. And we were talking to Craig earlier, too. That's one of his favorite things to uh, carry around for woodcock and stuff, too. So. Oh, yeah. I've been 20. I got a 20 gauge when I was, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, probably. And I, I still, it's probably still one of my favorite guns to carry out in the field. Well, so. there's something to be said for the availability of ammo. Um, for those as well. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Mandy says, "Awesome job, Bailey." A doll was mentioned for porky attacks. What is the doll used for? Um, so it's uh, there's you can either make one, uh, and you can Google it, uh, and there'll be different um, diagrams for how to make one, or you can purchase them from various dog supply stores. But it's a a wooden dowel. And then there's going to be either a bungee or a cinch strap over the top. Um, the dowel will go in the 
back molars of the dog's teeth and they bite down on it. And then the strap will go around their head um, and secure on the other side of the dowel. And that way you can pull the coals out of the inside of the mouth without them. Um, that, it's not that they're going to bite down on you. It's just they don't have a choice and they're constantly biting down on the quills as well. And so it provides them a little bit of comfort. So the, even if you're not going to pull the quills out yourself, having the dowel along to get them um, to the vet with a, a, maybe a little bit, um, you know, a little more comfort, a little less pain um, is uh, a nice and it's a light thing to carry. So. Great. I'd never seen that before. Good to know. I, I don't want to over like, um, like porcupines aren't a humongous issue. It's just that they're such a nuisance when they are. So yeah. Thomas had a similar question. So hopefully that answered your question, Thomas. Uh, Mosin is asking, is there training for beginners or shadow opportunities to learn? So I, I know we're going to try to do one with the pheasant opener possibly, but do you know of any other organizations? I know Pheasants Forever does do some some learn to hunt type, type classes. But. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and there's quite a bit in Minnesota as well. Um, the, yeah, you mentioned Pheasants Forever. They have a, a wonderful youth program. They have a um, very, very wonderful um, women's hunting program, the women on the wing program. There's quite a few women's, um, hunt, women specific hunting programs, but there's others as well. Um, in here in Minnesota, we have modern carnivore. He has, um, it's a adult learn to hunt program. Um, and so it's sort of different than what you normally see, which is a lot of youth uh, specific, but, um, they'll have, um, they have an entire upland bird training camp. Um, pheasants forever just put out an upland bird training camp. That's all virtual. Yep. They're really well produced videos, uh, and I think they're free. You just need to sign up on, um, I think on YouTube or online, um, to watch those programs. Those are really great. Um, uh, yeah, other various mentorship op opportunities, um, or you can always just reach out, um, uh, you know, and see if anybody is willing to take you out to learn. I, I don't, I didn't mention it in my pro program and I and I hate to say it I I never recommend reaching out for um like specific um species like hunting locations via Facebook but if you're looking to like for an opportunity to just go out with somebody that is something that you know you you could do um but reaching out through these different mentorship um programs is is definitely a way to go and um, it's a great way to see a lot of different dogs too. If it's something, if your dog curious, but you don't have one yet, um, yeah, go on to different events or gosh, if you drove around on pheasant opener, I can guarantee somebody would be, you know, willing to take you along as part of their party or, um, you know, you get to see a lot of different dogs out as well. That's a great idea too. If you're, if you're dog curious, I love that. Is there's, it's a slippery slope, though. Yeah. Speaking from somebody that has how many dogs? <laughs> just four. A manageable just, four. Just four. <laughs> um, I'm putting a link in the chat for, you mentioned Modern Carnivore, Mark Norquist, a, a good mm -hmm. friend of ours, does a lot of awesome work around the state. He helped out with that Pheasants Forever um, yep. to hunt yep. upland birds. Yeah, he has Thanks a grouse, so. grouse and woodcock workshop, but that's just this weekend. So I think that's coming up maybe a little too soon, but maybe there's some spots open. Great. And there's, there's some other opportunities. Uh, it's a great uh, place to find some of that information out. I found too, if you go to a local gun range and hang out mm -hmm. on a weekend before the season and just look at people that don't have fancy over and unders, but are maybe out there with a camouflage gun or just a, a, a normal looking shotgun they're not there shooting the trap league every saturday they might actually be hunters that are out there practicing and talk to them see if they'd be interested in taking you out so it's always a, a great way to meet people too so and practice because practice is practice and practice and more practice so yeah. um, andre was asking does the gps mapping function on cell phones generally work when outside of phone coverage area that's a great question that is a little confusing yeah it's it just really depends um there's so many different 
apps and I don't want to list any necessarily specifically, but some of the great ones, um, you know, you have the opportunity to, uh, if you're doing your e-scouting and your, your prep for um, your, your trip or, or, you know, if it, even if it's just a day of hunting, um, to the opportunity to download those areas before you go out is really invaluable because a lot of times you aren't going to know if you have cell phone reception. I up here in um, on the North Shore, I just assume that I'm not going to. So I just started everything before I go. Um, but yeah, there's there's different apps that um, that do allow you that function. And some of the newer phones have I heard the, so the new iPhone or something has like SOS GPS capabilities now, which nice. is pretty amazing to me, but yeah. they're always changing too on that stuff. So, but, but generally I've used, you know, having a handheld GPS unit is, is awesome. Cause that always works as long as you have batteries for it, but mm -hmm. you mentioned a compass and I happen to be of the belief that the compass is probably the most underutilized tool these days with all this technology that people don't carry. I usually have one right here in my desk and it's not here right now, but they just don't carry them as much as they used to. And it's one of those invaluable tools to have with you and know a little bit how to use it. So, yeah, definitely. We still, um, on most of our hunter walking trails are going to have like either not a paper, maybe not a paper map that you can carry with you, but you can take a picture of it or something at the trailhead, but just having a compass along to orient yourself to maybe some of the features, whether it be a stream or a trail or something is, it's just handy, um, and yep. I think it's a dying art, <laughs> but it's useful. It is. So, uh, Mark was asking, and he says, I own a 410 shotgun that I've never used. Would it be a good gauge for this prey? I've shot some birds with a 410 before. Yeah. Yeah, I, it just depends on what you're comfortable with. Uh, you're going to be maybe a little more limited in range or something like that, but... Um, I think the 410 is sometimes a bit of a, um, like people might scoff at using it for um, larger quarry, uh, but if you're smart and, you know, do your research about um, your shot cell, your shot shell um, size and, um, you know, your choke size, uh, and then maybe just bring your range in a little bit, then you should be fine. The, Number of BBs, you might be surprised. Uh, sometimes it's quite comparable. So, yeah, I think with the newer shells with like heavy shot and some mm -hmm. of the steel shells and stuff, you can get a little more performance out of some of those guns than you used to be able to. And it's it's worth looking into that and practicing. I think, especially if it's something you have. Yep. So, uh, Carol, Cassie, if you didn't put the link to Women on the Wings program in there, Carol was asking if there's a link to that program. We will try to put that in the chat for you. Um, Jamie says, I'd love a list of women's learn to hunt in-person references. So um, you mentioned a couple. I know the bull program would be where I'd steer people to. So mm -hmm. if you wanted, yeah, Minnesota yeah. actually has... Um... I don't know if it, I think maybe it was the first, I don't want to speak out of place, but um, a, a women specific um, Pheasants Forever chapter, which I think is pretty cool um, and yep. unique, but yeah, there's- Lady Flippers. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of different information out there, it, you know, and we have a hard enough time finding um, gear and clothes specifically for us, but in, in terms of m the mentorship programs, there's, um, a few different organizations out there, uh, a few 501c3s as well. The Her Upland um, uh, is another one that's uh, gaining some uh, popularity and they're just doing a lot more events. Uh, great program. Um, but yeah, yeah, we can put together a list of uh, women specific events or programs. Yeah. Yeah, and look on the DNR website, look under the Becoming Outdoor Woman program, Linda Bylander would be happy to connect you with with uh, mentors and stuff there. She's got workshops every fall that do hunting stuff, and I know she's got a deer hunt down in Eagle Bluff this here in a couple weeks, too. So. Awesome. Uh, Hannah, you might have to decipher this one for me, but 
Hannah's asking, are the HWT species specific or can you hunt any species on them? Yeah, great question. You can, so on the hunter walking trails in Minnesota, um, you can hunt anything. It's not, a, they're not just directed for grouse hunting, um, but just the fact that they tend to be in the forested part of the state, um, eh, I'm using that loosely because there are some in the transition zone. Um, but, uh, you don't need to, you know, mow a path through the, uh, most of the prairie. <laughs> so, um, these are specifically maintained on mainly on forested lands just for access purposes. Um, one of my hunter walking trails is actually on an aquatic management area on a trout stream. So it's not only hunter access, but fisher, um, or angler access as well. Um, and it just provides more opportunity. Um, it, it, people like to hunt along trails. Um, if you don't have a dog, it's going to be a great and successful way to grouse hunt is to walk slowly along, um, you know, a maintained trail because there's going to be more fruiting shrubs out on the edges. There's going to probably be a ground layer, uh, clover or strawberry that they prefer. Um, and they just also tend to, to be out, lots of critters tend to be out on trails. Um, you know, at the beginning of the day when the sun might be shining through or the woods are a little damp or something. So not specifically managed for grouse and woodcock, but uh, can be a really great way to get into grouse and woodcock covers. Um, totally welcome for deer hunters to, to utilize them, squirrel hunters, rabbit hunters, you name it. Not species specific, but very, very, um, you know, just a great um, I think they're great opportunities, uh, and a lot of times they're, you know, they're just out there on, on managed lands. The reason that they're created is probably because there was some sort of timber access route utilized, um, and that created that trail to begin with. And so, um, yeah. I think I just read this morning someplace that there's over 600 miles of walk-in access trails in Minnesota for, for hunting, which is amazing. So, I mean, you could, you want me be able to hunt every trail in the state of Minnesota in a year. Most people want at least. So that's a lot of miles of trail. Oh yeah. So I think I got through all the questions on there. If you have any more, put them in there. We have just a minute left, but I think with that, again, all these are recorded. So if you're looking for a checklist or some of those slides that Bailey put up, go back to our recording. It should be up there on our past recording webinars tab on our website uh, probably by Monday we'll have that up or you can get the YouTube link also and just watch that and remind yourself and make a list on your computer to, things to check off because uh, Billy did a fantastic job and gave out some just great information and things that people don't always think of when they're going out bird hunting so thank you for helping keep everybody safe and I hope everybody has a fun weekend out there get outside enjoy the great outdoors and all the public lands we have across the state of Minnesota. So uh, next week we're talking turkeys. So we're gonna keep on the bird theme and talk about fall turkey hunt next week. So hope to see everybody then.